Good evening et bonsoir. My name is Barbara Botriel, and I'm a member of the Heritage Ottawa Lecture Series Committee. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this evening's event. With our lecture tonight, we're making International Women's Day, which fell on March 8th, and uh, somewhat belatedly, February's International Day of the Women and Girls in Science. Tonight's presentation by Sharon O'Dell will feature the contributions of women who were able to achieve careers in astronomy at Canada's National Observatory, the Dominion Observatory built in 1904 at the site of the Central Experimental Farm near Dow's Lake in Ottawa. For many years, it was known to Canadians as the source of, the, uh, of Canada's official time signal. This year, Ottawa's observatory campus turns 120 years old and many are calling for it to be celebrated for its architectural significance and its social connection to the nation's scientific achievement history. It also seems to be a particularly appropriate topic as the astronomically significant event of the total eclipse of the sun draws near on April the 8th. Before we get started, I'd like to express some thanks. Our lecture series had made possible by the generosity of our sponsor, Andrex Holdex Incorporated and Sandy Smallwood. Sandy has been a supporter of Heritage Ottawa for many years. We're also grateful for an operations grant from the uh, city of Ottawa and a heritage grant from the province of Ontario. I'd also like to say a word about membership. Heritage Ottawa is a member-based organization and we're asking you to consider supporting us by becoming a member or by renewing your membership or by making a donation. For those who are already members or who have made a donation, we thank you. Having a membership is really the simplest way of having a real and measurable impact on heritage conservation in Ottawa. And donations help us to offer programming such as this lecture, which is free, and right now, your support is more important than ever. It's only by having people like you behind us that we can continue to be heard as we respond to challenging issues such as the federal government's Bill C-23 regarding the Historic Places Act of Canada, as well as more local issues like the Central Experimental Farm and Lansdowne II and the implication of Bill 23 for the, the, the Ontario government has brought in. Your help really does make a difference. As well, being a member of Heritage Ottawa connects you with a really agreeable community of like-minded people who are interested in and care about the history and the heritage and the quality of the built environment in the city. So if you are already a member or you've made a donation, we certainly extend our, our heartfelt thanks. If not, I urge you to go ahead. Just go to our membership page on the website at heritageottawa.org and with the click of the mouse and your credit card, you become a member of this community. Ottawa is at the heart of a vast homeland whose history reaches back long before the era we will feature tonight. For hundreds of years, Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples have been pressing for their Indigenous rights to be respected and their history to be understood. Heritage Ottawa makes efforts through our programs and partnerships to bring awareness to Algonquin history and heritage with events and programming. It is now a real pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Sharon O'Dell has had a 28-year career in museology she has a graduate degree in art history from Carleton University and a museum studies diploma from Algonquin College. She specializes in research on art and architecture and the history of women in science. She's a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, as well as a member of Heritage Ottawa. And Sharon has agreed to take some questions at the end of this presentation. Our moderator for the Q&A session will be former Ottawa Heritage, Heritage Ottawa board member, Anne Mayhew. 
and has been a, a fine arts conservator for over 40 years, specializing in the treatment of works on paper. She has delivered international workshops and lectures on conservation treatments and research into artist materials and techniques, and has worked at the National Gallery of Canada and at Library and Archives Canada. More recently, she was named a visiting museum scholar at the Getty Museum, and she served as an adjunct professor at Queen's University in the Masters of Art Conservation Program. She currently maintains a private practice in Ottawa. Thanks, Anne, for moderating this evening's questions. At the end of Sharon's lecture, Anne will remind you to submit your questions into the Q&A function on your screen. And with that, I'm now going to hand the evening over to Sharon O'Dell. Good evening, everyone. I will be presenting a brief history on the women astronomers who worked and or interacted with Ottawa's Dominion Observatory, situated to this day on the Central Experimental Farm. With an image on this front slide, the two women astronomers standing in the center of a group of men in front of the Dominion Observatory are Ruth J. Northcott, at the left visiting from Toronto, and Miriam S. Berlin standing beside her, the first first-class woman astronomer to work at the Dominion Observatory and the first to work in Canada. This photo was taken during a June 1938 meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I will speak a bit about these women astronomers' careers at or in close connection to the Dominion Observatory in addition to Dr. Helen Sawyer Hogg and Dr. Mary Gray. However, as Dr. Gray was the last astronomer to work until the closure of the Canadian Astronomy Program in 1970 at the Dominion Observatory, the focus for the latter half of this presentation will be on Dr. Gray and her advocacy for protecting the Dominion Observatory campus of buildings. Concentrating on this observatory's important scientific architecture and astronomical instruments it once held, Dr. Gray disseminated the scientific Canadian architectural history through her education to the public until her death in 1996. Also, she tried in her own way as early as 1975 to commemorate other women astronomers like herself within the use of the Dominion Observatory history. To give an idea of the challenges these women astronomers faced during the early 20th century, even having access to the study of physics and astronomy was difficult, let alone achieving access to work at the Dominion Observatory. For these Canadian women, being able to have a career at such a national observatory was against the odds. Before 1935, when Ruth Northcott, Miriam Berland, and Helen Sawyer Hogg first set out to have careers in astronomy, there were few to no examples of other women before them in Canada. And for Dr. Gray, her career as the last astronomer to work at the Dominion Observatory with the 15-inch Dominion telescope can be seen as benefiting from their mentorship to in turn teach others of the trade herself. But first I will explain what the Dominion Observatory campus itself is and its continuing importance as a landmark for the achievements in astronomy on a national level in Canada. When this first National Observatory for Canada opened in Ottawa in April of 1905, its function was to mirror that of the Royal Observatory of Greenwich, to become a Canadian institutional resource used for timekeeping, railway and survey requirements by also holding the Canadian Prime Meridian at its site. For example, this observatory's campus's meridian was instrumental for setting boundaries between the provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta. The Dominion Observatory's architecture was also purposefully chosen to be the high Romanesque revival style, built by Dominion architect David Ewart, who was instructed to build Ottawa into a capital for the country. 
The style was used in order to visually highlight the national importance of the science of astronomy that Canada could seriously participate in on a global level. Today, the same architecture still holds great national, local, and social significance in North America. That is, still compared to other observatory histories around the world. And thankfully, this building's legacy has been preserved in part to the keen foresight of its past staff, often referred to, to as the Dominion Observatory family of current building keepers and those who are now retirees. The late director of seismology, Dr. John Hodgson, who became director of the Earth Physics Branch of Energy Mines and Resources, EMR, in 1979, now known presently as Natural Resources Canada, and ARCAN, wrote the first two volume history on this building, titled The Heavens Above and the Earth Beneath. However, I will focus on the observatory's architecture in relation to the early Canadian women astronomers that mentored and influenced each other that is missing from Dr. Hodgson's written account. Through this Dominion Observatory and others that were built to assist this observatory and valued astronomy research, including the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory in BC and privately owned David Dunlap Observatory in Richmond Hill, Toronto. Most Canadian women astronomers during the 1920s and 30s were also members of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, often called RASC. It was the only society in Canada for astronomers and the first to allow women to be members. Otherwise, astronomers would have to join science societies in the United States, France, or Britain. So they had some support with their careers during a time when there was only a handful of women practicing astronomy in the entire country. But it also was a time when only few Canadian universities or colleges would allow women to take physics and the applied science of astronomy. Astronomer Miriam Berlin was able to access physics and astronomy studies at McGill University. Pictured in the slide, she studied at the McGill Observatory which was attached to a McGill campus house, which is unfortunately now demolished. And in another image, her graduation photo can be seen here taken in 1926 after her internship at the Dominion Observatory and prior to being hired on there as the first woman astronomer in 1928. However, if Ms. Berlin had tried to attend Queen's University in Kingston, instead of McGill University in Quebec, at a time when Queens attempted to allow admittance of women into science and mathematic courses during the 1920s and earlier, she likely would not have graduated from physics. Male students and professors opposed women attending any science or math classes so much that it led to the Queens University in Kingston banning women students from science and math curriculum until well after the Second World War. Careers involving scientific pursuits for women were just as rare, especially after World War I, when, when work was reserved for returning veterans, mostly men. In reference to this, the Canadian government also exasperated the issue of non-acceptance of women into scientific work roles. By placing a decree in 1920, which disallowed women to continue working in any role that was deemed fit for veterans return if they were to marry. Again, this continued for lengthy generations until the Canadian government lifted this idea of sexist exclusion in 1955 through Sir Robert Borden's time as prime minister. Some of the articles Dr. Burling kept in her scrapbook dated from the 1930s were clipped out to remind her of why she was pursuing such a career. As she would explain in another news interview she had at the time of her retirement in 1968, choosing to work in astronomy meant working with men and it wasn't easy. There was no women's washroom in the observatory. Even her prescribed feminine dress code was difficult to work with. 
leading her to apply for permission to wear pants like her male colleagues when working in the cold observatory during winter months. But her persistence paid off in 1930. This is when Dr. Berlin was recognized early in her career as finding planet X, now known to us today as Pluto, from images taken through Ottawa's Dominion 15-inch refracting telescope at the Dominion Observatory. Pluto, of course, is now, now not recognized as a planet at all. But in the 1930s, it was astounding to learn that a woman astronomer participated in its discovery. This discovery cemented Dr. Berlin's career into the Canadian history of astronomy and relation to the Dominion Observatory so much that by the last few years she worked at the observatory, she won awards for that early achievement and many others afterwards. At the same time, Dr. Berlin was working at the Dominion Observatory in Ottawa. Dr. Helen Sawyer Hogg was working at the Sister Dominion Astrophysical Observatory in British Columbia, an observatory purpose built by the Canadian government to assist the national one here in Ottawa. Dr. Sawyer Hogg later in her career was known for her own work through membership with RASC. However, she did not become known too far from her, her inner circle of Dominion Astrophysical staff or the Dominion Observatory during her early career. That's because during the 1920s, she was working for free as an assistant to her husband, astronomer Dr. Frank Hogg. Canada, in effect, got two astronomers for the price of one. Seen here in an Ottawa Dominion Observatory staff workflow chart of 1929 to 33. Dr. Berlin's name can be seen in the left top second row as a grade one astronomer for the main 15 inch equatorial telescope. However, only Frank S. Hogg in far bottom right corner is noted under the heading of scientific grade two astronomer within the sister BC Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. There is no mention of his wife's name, Dr. Helen Sawyer Hogg, who, who was still working with them at that time without pay or credit for work completed. In fact, fellow staff witnessed accounts recall when Sawyer Hogg would even come to work with her first children in bassinets that she would stow within the observatory corner where the children would sleep while their mom would work through the night. It was only when the Sawyer Hogg family left the Dominion Observatory's network for work at the new David Dunlap Observatory that Helen Sawyer Hogg received her own position and pay separate from that of her husband, Frank Hogg, and thus began her recognition. The Dunlap was built in Richmond Hill outskirts of Toronto in fall of 1933 to be close to the University of Toronto astronomy program and to not be too far from the Dominion Observatory in Ottawa. Within this Toronto circle of astronomers, working at the David Dunlop Observatory, more than one woman astronomer worked at the same place. As seen in a 1939 staff photo, Dr. Ruth Northcott, Ms. E.M. Fuller, and Dr. Helen Sawyer Hogg were seen collaborating together as staff at this privately owned observatory supported by the Toronto millionaire, David Dunlap. Dr. Northcott became well known within the University of Toronto as a mentor and the RASC Society through her work at Dunlap. She also became a president of RASC, publishing many papers on astronomy until her life shortened due to illness and eventual passing in 1968. This also was the same year her fellow woman, woman astronomer and great friend and colleague, Dr. Berland, retired. All this said, the history of Ottawa's Dominion Observatory and sister observatories with the addition of women astronomers at those sites, as well as at the privately owned Dunlap Observatory in nearby Toronto, 
became mentors to the last woman astronomer to work in the main D Dominion Observatory, Dr. Mary Gray. And from this part of the presentation, I would like to focus on how Ms. Gray promoted the history of the Dominion Observatory. Through her education to the public and on its architectural history and scientific instruments that were built to suit the campus of buildings. While working at the Dominion Observatory, Dr. Gray already led public and educational tours. Working as a successor to Dr. Miriam Berland, she continued to advocate for the observatory's preservation upon leaving the Dominion Observatory at time of the closure of the National Astronomy Program in 1970. This was due to increasing light pollution. She did this through a second career as a curator at the National Science and Technology Museum. As a vocal and recognized member of the community and as a past RASC president, Gray successfully raised awareness of this unique building and its inherent value to Canada. She facilitated a stronger external recognition of the observatory through the rare examples of Canada's first historical telescopes. Through her support and scientific work, while doing so, she also highlighted the significance of the Dominion Observatory's unpublicized historic role in its staff for mentoring and enabling the first Canadian women scientists to practice physics and astronomy on a national level. This is through the examples of Dr. Gray herself, her predecessor, Dr. Miriam Berland, who began work at the Dominion Observatory in 1928 to 1968 and astronomer Dr. Helen Sawyer Hogg, who worked with astronomical staff in Ottawa from Astrophysical Observatory in BC, as well as the relationship they had with Dr. Ruth Northcott. Dr. Gray's education also focused on the Dominion Observatory's historic architecture that was specifically built for scientific use. And here I will explain the Dominion Observatory's architecture in more detail like a virtual tour, will give a better understanding as to why it was so important to Canadian astronomy and in turn allowing staff, including women astronomers, to strive in their careers there. The plan to build a National Observatory for Canada began in the 1890s, and the famous observatory designed by Christopher Wren in Greenwich inspired modern architectural ideas for it. During that time, British architecture was regarded as resource examples since Canada had been its colony. As well, Rand's Greenwich Observatory design was known to be completed by the first architect who also was one of the few to combine his knowledge of physics and astronomy with architecture as he taught astronomy at Oxford in 1661. The result of the Jacobean style that Wren used at Greenwich became known as an early modern structure. Less ornate and conservative than past styles of architecture, it is a mix of borrowed detail from prior historic institutions and churches. This outcome allowed this particular observatory to have one of the first visual identifiers considered as a scientific modern appearance for buildings that hold science. When David Ewart, born in 1841 and passing in 1921, was chosen to be the Dominion architect for many funded government buildings in Canada's capital, he was influenced by Wren's 17th century style of scientific modern institution. However, for the first new National Canadian Observatory, he strived to give the architecture a visual image of independence from Britain as Canadians moved away from colonization. Ewart, originally from Scotland, took a mix of medieval architectural designs from the 11th and 12th century cathedrals and castles to create one of many new modern building styles for Canada's own identifying legacy. Often exemplifying in an innovative, simplified form of what he thought Canada's scientific institutions to be. Ewart also considered the ideal location sought by first grade Canadian astronomers William King and his colleague Otto Klotz. 
Both would become directors of this observatory once it was completed within the Canadian Central Experimental Farm within a section of earth science set aside during the confederation between 1867 and 1886. Once observatory plans were finalized in 1902, the same section of CEF landscape became known as the National Resource of Canada Observatory Campus. The site was chosen then because its rural area of the, on the outskirts of the city capital in order to avoid light pollution and to have the building positioned with elevation advantageously in the midst of low-lying farmland above tree lines. It became an immediate tourist attraction of Canada's scientific pursuits in astronomy. Even at the construction phase, there were stereographic images. Postcards uh, back then were also popular of this building, dating between 1902 to 1909. When the observatory opened in 1905, Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier noted the achievement of what would be a symbol of Canada's progress in astronomical science as a newly formed country. He also accredited the visual identity of the new government funded buildings as representing the nation's progress through Ewart's design. Ewart continued to have a role as Dominion Architect in Ottawa 18, 1896 until 1914. His known examples are the Royal Canadian Mint, the Dominion Archive and the Victoria Memorial Building in 1921, originally for the Geological Survey of Canada in 1912, which now houses the Canadian Museum of Nature. Unlike his predecessors, architects Thomas Seton Scott and Thomas Fuller, Ewart chose not to work with the neo-Gothic style, but with a baronial mix of Tudor and Gothic revival. This explains the use of a second final phase of Romanesque revival style that was used to build the Dominion Observatory. Ideas were taken from the medieval churches, such as the famous Lincoln Cathedral dating 1073, in which decorative detail would be parred down to achieve simplified architectural designs in order to modernize. Ewart's practiced this to exemplify Canada as not just a commonwealth under Britain, but a growing increasingly independent country. By implementing less decorum from past features of Romanesque cathedrals, he strived to instill a language of historic tradition into a newly built Canadian presence in order to exert an innovative modern permanence with use of the past, while associating the construction of this national observatory with the country's progress in science. For this reason, Ewart was likely influenced by the circle of architects led by American Henry Hobson Richardson, who favored this high style of architecture to meet the requirements for a new nation. The observatory executed a similar taste of Richardsonian Romanesque revival style that was seen throughout North America and named Free Manor. Characteristically inspired by the 12th century arched windows from the first Romanesque revival phase. Ewart built the observatory within this architectural trend that was still popularly employed in Canadian churches, university campuses, and institutions, as seen in James Lennox's design of Toronto City Hall in 1890 and Simon and Ray's Ontario Hall in 1902 at Queen's University, Kingston. The Romanist revival's visual language was highlighted in its application towards the creation of the Canadian Dominion style of buildings. This was achieved with the observatory's facade by usage of square windows on lower levels in comparison to round arched ones placed at the second and third stories. An intentional illusion borrowed from lengthy one-piece windows on medieval cathedrals. However, the observatory alludes to tall window panes that are actually two separate shorter ones that draws the viewer's eye up as if both windows are unified. 
an architectural trick to bring the central metal dome roof set high above an arched entry door into focus view. Other Romanesque revival features can be attributed to the heavy castle-like chiseled red sandstone walls, which not only exemplifies the expense embedded into these materials lending a richness of color, but excludes an important sense of nation building with its heavy appearance and reflection of the serious nature of science held within. Irit's challenge was to design a cultural institution with an understanding for science that also placed focus on Canada's specific pursuit of astronomy. When entering the doorway itself, the lentil label of the building stating observatory makes no mistake as to what this building is for. In addition, there are detailed stone carved foliage and columns at each side of the main door of Roman and Greek motifs which lend a classical style to the entryway as visual reminders of where some past history in astronomy can be found. The ground floor of the building was utilized the same way between 1905 right up until 1970. In later years, it accommodated the addition of seismology, geomagnetism, and mapping staff. Consisting of a front entry with a circular inner shaped vestibule, a wide central cylindrical observation pier can be seen presently surrounded by a 1958 ceiling mural by artist Huang Gore. The pier served as a function for where the 15 inch retracting telescope would sit. By being well placed into a double into the stable level ground below, while reaching the top third and fourth floors. This was a crucial architectural design because accuracy required the telescope to sit separate from the rest of the building, protected from wind and human made vibration. The main floor of the building was divided into two wings with original tiled flooring that can be seen today. The U-shaped staircase at the central rear gives access to the other floors above. The west wing accommodated the transit house. This is where Canada's fame ref famed reference meridian is placed, just outside, commemorated with a plaque in relation to a southern azimuth that stands a few hundred feet away. The entrance to the basement stairwell reveals materials used to decorate the inner architecture, adding to a continued sense of visible weight from the outside. Heavy marble stairs up to five feet thick windowsills lend an impression of density and expense. As one enters the basement, the wall is curved where the telescopic pier enters the ground and where curved office space held the wireless or clock room for transfer of time signals across Canada. The west wing accommodated the main seismograph, whereas the north lower floor held a solar research lab and battery room. The third and fourth upper floors are found below the observer observation dome. This is where the 15 inch retractable telescope was kept and this equipment dictated overall design of the observatory. Part of the design consists of a wooden floating floor within the dome that astronomers would walk upon as it was mounted to the outer architecture separate from the tall central pier of where the telescope sat unhindered by vibration. The walls of the dome are not insulated as part of the functional necessity, allowing the rib cage of the dome and the clockwork mechanisms for the roof opening to be seen. It's called a cold room. The space was designed to maintain the same temperature as the outside environment, no matter the season. This requirement maintained the telescope visual accuracy with no fogging of the lens glass. 
In order to assist with the maintenance of outer and inner temperatures, the base of the round dome has a series of window vents for increased airflow. Also, the balustrade circling the outside foot of the dome enabled access for repairs and viewing by eye. This top floor also housed an east wing with two small warm rooms that would have held the electrical equipment for the telescope and astronomers' usage. The end large room was occupied for photography with wall-to-wall -to, -wall to ceiling height windows capturing natural light. These glass panes were strategically placed at the back of the building so as to not detract from the central observatory dome's stately appearance from the front facade. The dome is where the workings of astronomy would happen. Its traditional function was the science of the age. And this is where Mary Gray, the last astronomer of the Dominion Observatory would carry out her daily research until her enthusiasm for astronomy would move her towards continued preservation for the historic telescopic equipment and the building itself. Due to the Department of Interior, Interior's need for precise coordinates and timekeeping, the scale of equipment was ordered prior to the observatory construction. This meant that the 15 inch retracting telescope was purchased in 1897 directly influencing the specific design plans of the observa observation dome we still see today. These were drawn in 1898, the plans to accommodate the largest telescope in Canada at that time, requiring an impressive interior observation space yet functional size of 30 feet. Mary Gray conducted her research at this observatory from 15 1958 until 1973. She was originally from Chipman, New Brunswick, and she received her Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of New Brunswick. A self-taught astronomer, her career began at the Geodetic Survey of Canada, GSD, between 1941 and the early 1950s. The main building for GSD was located beside the Dominion Observatory in Ottawa, also built by Ewart in 1914. From 1940 until 1985, the geodetic survey was the first order field of astronomy that had control of the Laplace azimuths. These official geographic points are regulated by triangulation through astronomical coordinates. Gray likely worked at GSD for the astronomic positioning of mapping. Therefore, it was through the GSD department in which Dr. Gray obtained her first experience in practical astronomy. However, she has stated that her passion for astronomy only really took off like fire after moving to the Dominion Observatory in Ottawa. Her professional research conducted at the Dominion Observatory was primarily with the 15 inch refracting telescope. Like her predecessors at the observatory, Gray provided a public education function. For example, often Saturday evening stargazing at the observatory was offered to the public for night sky viewings through the historic telescopic instruments especially the 15-inch refractor, which would allow visitors to examine the inner architecture of the observation dome. When technological improvements allow professional astronomers access to larger telescopes, this caused the federal government to transfer all astronomy activities from the Dominion Observatory to the Research Council of Canada in 1970. After that year, public education became the only function the observatory served due to interest in its nationally significant architecture and in connection to the historic Canadian astronomy equipment. However, this education at the observatory finally ceased when public access to the dome and 15 inch telescope became a fire code violation. With no official astronomy function and no public education, the telescopes of the Dominion Observatory were at a standstill. 
until Dr. Gray made an unprecedented, unprecedented and controversial decision. In the fall of 1974, the 15-inch telescope was removed and placed under the stewardship of Dr. Gray, who assumed the new role of Curator of Physical Sciences at the National Science and Technology Museum in Ottawa. The museum's acquisition of this instrument and the addition of the solar telescope and the Transip Equatorial Telescope would in turn leave the observatory on its own. While at the museum, Dr. Gray held various offices within the Ottawa Centre branch of the RASC or Royal Astronomical Society of Canada between 1964 until her passing in 1996. This is when she nationally chaired the Committee on Publications in which she wrote notes on the Dominion Observatory for the journal. Her career at the museum allowed her to continue her history on the observatory and Canadian astronomy. She gained public interest through teaching, radio broadcasting, writing newspaper columns in the museum's quarterly titled Stargazing and Sky News. Dr. Gray's interest in history and heritage of the Dominion Observatory and the related telescopes was very evident in her informed talks on the history and the architecture and the social fabric that tied these constellations of history together. The example of her efforts to preserve the meaningful information behind the Dominion Observatory's past and present architectural existence could be seen in her installation at the museum. An education-based observatory was constructed so that the 15-inch telescope could be operational again. Large poster-sized images of the Dominion Observatory building were placed around the interior of this makeshift viewing dome as well. This building, which opened in January 15, 1975, eventually was dedicated to Helen Sawyer Hogg in 1989. The recognition given to Hogg Sawyer was in part for her promotion of astronomy at the museum. In addition for the same accomplishment, Gray also received the Civil Service Association of Canada's prestigious merit award that same year. The Sawyer Hogg Observatory continued to house over 30 years of public viewing sessions with the Dominion Telescope. However, in December 2016, as part of the new museum renovations for 2017 year opening, the Hogg Sawyer Observatory was dismantled. Presently, the 15 inch telescope has been placed in storage with an indefinite date as to when it will return to educational display or use again. Through Gray, Dr. Gray's honoring of women astronomers as pioneering in their field, combined with her four running examples on publicizing and teaching the public about the history of astronomy program at the Dominion Observatory, allowed her to not only publish research, but to also interact on both a local and national level in order to disseminate this history, all while advocating for the architecture and tools of her trade in a vouch to continue the preservation. These pieces of knowledge instilled in her were exported into conducted tours to the public concerning the interior inner workings of the Dominion Observatory. As well, in her later life at the museum, she continued to teach and advocate. However, as great as the museum is, the architecture of the Dominion Observatory is still thought of as key to possible future tours in this historic context. Especially this is felt now by astronomy, interest groups because of the loss of the Sawyer Hogg Observatory and because of the Dominion Observatory's situated geographical placement, which adds unparalleled value to its related telescopic artifacts as a working scientific historic architectural choice of buildings. Dr. Gray's passion expressed the Dominion Observatory as no ordinary place to house scientific research the solid and grand Romanesque revival style of architecture used in its construction was specifically chosen to represent the importance of Canada's scientific pursuits and to underline the permanency and nationalism of a young country. Astronomy, seismology, surveying, and geomagnetism were not simply important areas of research contained within the observatory. 
They were a means of strengthening Canada's independence from Britain. The symbolism of the Dominion Observatory as expressed in its striking architecture was of equal importance to Canada as a scientific research it was to contain. Many believe that it should continue to be protected for these reasons at both the national and local level. Seen as a historical landmark of the prime meridian that many active astronomers today are calling to have celebrated. There is, however, still further work to be done to ensure its protection, along with the related outer buildings that make up the Canada's central experimental farm as a whole. Given new cause for concern with the present transfer of CEF lands to the Ottawa Civic Hospital. When the Dominion Observatory of Science and Astronomy and its public education discourse on the subject moved to the museum, it pushed public knowledge of what used to be an open door institution to that of one that could be invited inside of, to that of a view only from the outside. This building and its related ones only remain important now from an outer perspective of an historical example of use of high architectural style of the Romanesque revival that only from this viewpoint alludes to astronomy with its dome central roof. There exists a government culture of private different use now for the observatory, for another branch of the NRCAN instead of what used to be public ener ener energetic educational center that promoted Canada's finest achievements in astronomy. The Dominion Observatory once shared an abundant amount of knowledge with the public that was built to disseminate research. We must ask ourselves, how does the observatory building remain important presently? After all, the label of the National Dominion Observatory meant that this was the epitome of where one should go to find the most on the subject of astronomy within the country. Then again, without Dr. Mary Gray, one must wonder how would the history of national astronomy and the architecture of the Dominion Observatory read now without her intervention or without her mentors. This observatory still stands today in almost the exact appearance it did approximately 128 years ago. However, it will not continue to be there unless we continue to protect its scientific meaning and heritage. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sharon. That was an incredible lecture and such an amazing opportunity to learn about these women who obviously changed the face of, of, of scientific research for other women coming behind them in Canada, and also for the history of that really beautiful Dominion Observatory that unfortunately not many of us have been aware of, I think. Um, I have so many questions, but and I'll ask a few, and then I will um, encourage uh, anybody who has questions to please pose them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And I'll be moderating uh, the questions and comments to make sure that there's no repetition. Uh, Sharon, in your research, did you come across um, any evidence that these women uh, had any sort of relationship with astronomers, especially women astronomers from other countries? And you mentioned, or perhaps I read that there, of course, were other associations of astronomers globally, but did you come across any kind of um, interactions among them? Yeah, with Miriam Berland, for sure. Um, she she stayed single all her life, but we, we don't know exactly how her... Um, private and family life is. We know that she grew up in Lambert, Quebec. We know that her parents did support her mm -hmm. um, in her education, which was pretty interesting at that time um, to go into astronomy and science. But most of their relations were either in the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, but then also in the American Association and in France and then other parts of the country. And uh, obviously, many other astronomy astronomers would come through the doors, like they they had their own family and their own niche. 
and so those were the relationships that were built, but it's like a whole other string of research that I, I need to focus into next. And uh, it definitely is documented there, maybe not wholly, but there are uh, breadcrumbs that I have to follow. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a very rich area to be researching as well. And related to that question, I know I did a little bit of reading and some, I came across Caroline Herschel, who was the first paid female astronomer and who has who was credited um, as, well, she was the sister of Sir William Herschel, who was accredited with um, discovering, um, I guess, Uranus, which is not a planet, but a star, correct? I'm out of my depth here. <laughs> anyway, it, the fact that she was a sister of a famous astronomer, I wondered if, if, if you discovered familial relationships that would have inspired these women to take up astronomy, because I don't think it would have been something that, you know, the average woman, even interested in in um, applied science at the time would necessarily have chosen yeah that's what i also look for in my research as well where did they what made them think that this would be something they wanted to go into with all the odds against them for miriam berlin i i believe that um i don't remember or completely recall what her father did as an occupation but I, that's the next step to research into um, whether there was any correspondence that was left behind at McGill. Sometimes students would write home. And uh, it could be from the family, someone in the family. That's a guesstimate. But the, the one that I see as a pattern that has a little bit more evidence is just friendships being in sort of a, a circle that they found and then felt that they belonged or they felt really strongly. In researching some of uh, women's history in science and STEM, there were certain areas of science that were acceptable for women, such as herbariums, collecting uh, mm -hmm. plant fauna, et cetera. And there's uh, another history of that with the herbarium that's on the Central Experimental Farm as well. Uh, with science, it was, it was okay for um, especially in the, the United States, there were some women astronomers that it was fine for them to look at the photos or the, the research that the men had already produced. So they were there to count and review the glass slides and, uh, and, and you know, bring the measurements, do the counting and the comp what they call computing. And that was, uh, you know, an accepted role too. But it's not that often that you hear right off the bat uh, a woman astronomer coming out of a university, let alone a Canadian university, and then go straight into being mentored and trained to be first class. Right. And that was Dr. Miriam Berland. The other side to Ms. Berland, and I don't know her personal history so much but I do know what influenced her to never have children, to never have a family. Her family was the Dominion Observatory staff and the circles that she joined, because if she decided to have like a personal relationship and to have children or whatever, it was re even more um, of a heavy lifting to be accepted with the entire government against that. And basically you'd have to give up your livelihood, your career and just become a housewife. The only one exception to this, and that's why I use the example of Dr. Helen Sir Hogg, is that she did both, but she also had the situation where she wasn't fully accepted and just volunteering her time. Even though we've seen in the research that some of the research that, um, Dr. Helen Sir Hogg did was actually uh, given to the credit of her husband, Frank Hogg. And so I guess she decided, you know, he's the breadwinner and she had to give up those, those findings. But really when she was able to have her own place on the staff role, which was at Dunlap and unfortunately not at the federal um, levels, um, that's when they really saw that, oh, that's the mastermind <laughs> behind the, the uh, astronomer couple, per se. Not to say that Frank Hogg did not have, you know, good work himself, but she really did push the boundaries. Oh, 
I can't hear you, Anne. I'm muted because my phone was ringing. Thank okay. you. Uh, it, it's interesting to me because it called to mind the uh, a film that I saw called Hidden Figures, and I'm sure many of the audience have seen it as well, that um, uh, chronicled the um, African-American women who ended up working for NASA and the struggles they had being accepted as, you know, equal partners, shall we say, in the in the important research that was going on in that place. Okay, I have tons more questions, but let's look at some of the questions that we have posted from our audience. Uh, uh, one person writes, thank you for honoring these outstanding women astronomers. You've done superb research. I knew Mary Gray very well and worked with her in the astronomy program at the National Museum of Science and Technology for about 14 years into the early 1990s. And their question is, what specific advice would you offer to young women now who are interested in science and who seek a career in astronomy or any other STEM field? Well, my advice is um, it's, still, it's still an area where if you go into engineering or scientific pursuits, sometimes you're the only one or the second girl in the classroom. <laughs> and it's really well worth it to pursue it, especially today, because there, it's inching towards um, having more acceptance. Obviously, women are allowed into these programs now, but they often will take the undergrad level and then they'll go to graduate, but they never seem to follow through to a doctorate level. And that's basically what these women did, except it was learned mostly on the job, that that was, you know, what was done in that time, mostly. Um, you, you learned your doctorate while you were working with the tools of the trade. And uh, it's often because in science, you're often expected to have discoveries and research, and you have to keep producing that. And that also is still difficult to this day to have, say, if you want to have a relationship or a family, because you, you can't really take maternity leave because you just don't get the grants or the money to continue with your the flow of the continuation of your research. And so often it just seems to be um, like overwhelming for for a lot of women, but those who really, really what I would say, get the bug, the science bug, I, I say, go ahead and do it. And often you need to find like Mary Gray and Berlin, this was back a hundred years ago or 30 years ago, you find a mentor. They're the best because those women have gone through it before and they can, sometimes they're a little bit, what, what, what should I say? Like uh, Dr. Berlin, for instance, was not the friendliest. <laughs> She was very, very smart, but she had had a hard time, you know, with with the environment of just being the only woman and trying to be like them and always filtering and being on that level just to be heard and to be acknowledged. So by the time Dr. Mary Gray came to the observatory, um, she had to, she, she said in some of her notes that she had to... Um, walk around her her uh, predecessor in a certain way and speak to her and ask questions in a very thoughtful way to um, sort of tease out and, and bring out some of that mentorship. But you can find sometimes, like uh, there's Dr. Victoria Caspi, who works um, as an astronomer in Montreal, and she's really willing and able to uh, part her information, even with the technology today online, reading up on this and just just through the web. Whereas back then you really had to go to the observatories. You can do all this groundwork basically from your home. And that's how you pick out the names and then go meet these astronomers, these women astronomers and, and learn from them that way. That's good to know. And I get a sense that um, they were very generous with their mentorships, which I think is important. And here's a, a question that's somewhat related. Uh, another uh, viewer noticed uh, the uh, you're referring to both um, Gray and Berlin as Ms., Miss or Doctor. Mm -hmm. And did, did they 
actually obtain their doctorates or were they in fact honorary doctorates? The the doctor I think was obtained for uh, Dr. Helen Sawyer Hogg. She did go on to get more uh, education, but with a Dr. Mary Gray, it was honorary. Oh, interesting. And it was because of the education in in the in the observatory. So a lot of references in the research that I found, they they go between the Ms and the doctor, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and that's basically because even at that time, like Dr. Um, Gray, she also had a family. She was married. She was able to keep her job, though, because it was after World War II. Whereas, <laughs> whereas Dr. Berland, she, uh, she definitely um, couldn't. Dr. Berlin, she basically had what would be equal to a master's. They didn't really have a doctorate in astronomy uh, back then. So she, she basically just, again, was working and getting to that first level class that is your doctorate. So it was basically in-house for her. Mm -hmm. um, but Dr. Uh, Mary Gray was more of an honorary because she was so into the history and the architecture more than anything because she was the last one to step into the role and try and keep it running until it, it just wasn't and then she didn't have to continue it after then like she could have retired she could have moved on but she really went that extra step to try and save whatever she could yeah and that, and that brings to mind a question i had when she was working at the museum of science and tech um do you know if it was a paid position or was she volunteering? It was, she, she was likely volunteering oh. um, at first, but it was paid in the end. So when they heard that she was leaving the observatory, she obviously had to look for her second career or third career. Right. And, uh, and that's where she felt would probably be the best to marry both her skills as an astronomer, but also teach. And that came from honing, the, from, the honing of her teaching and education came from the observatory itself because as the astronomy program was getting older and it was passing more over to the, uh, the National Research Council, uh, they decided that already it would be a good place to um, promote astronomy, get more people, students and youth into learning about astronomy, getting them into the programs. And what better way if you see the main astronomer is a woman for having women students to actually want to pursue it. And they used to have, um, there's receipts in some of the research where they would have to replace and order new um, uh, like world globe or showing how the planets circulate around. It would be mechanized models. And even today, if you were to walk into that pier on the main uh, floor, they have these circular sort of like porthole framed images of what the history of the observatory is about. And it's all about explaining itself and the history of it and the astronomy program and the progress that was made in Canada. Because you're competing against other countries for what is new and inventive. Yeah, that makes sense. And that, that connects to another question. Uh, do you think the observatory might be participating in doors open Ottawa? It did already okay. Okay. participate in doors open Ottawa. This was a, a, a while ago. Um, apparently, mm -hmm. uh, I uh, after having uh, a presentation for uh, my last project in graduate uh, studies at Carleton University, um, I encouraged some of the staff to think about it, and they did. And uh, they had the observatory buildings open. Uh, mostly it was the seismology building, which is the other building by David Eurit that's over to the left of the observatory when you're facing it. And it's still part of the observatory campus. But a lot of the um, artifacts, objects that were in the main building were actually stored there. And so the staff, um, would, were, were there and it was a rare look inside uh, for the public. They actually, a lot of the public got a tour of the current civic hospital and then they came over to the observatory and got a view of the uh, seismology and the astronomy. And um, 
the interesting part of the tour was uh, being allowed to go down deep under the ground to the seismic vaults. And Very so there's cool. a tunnel that an underground world between the campus buildings that connect all of the, the several buildings that are on that campus uh, through underground tunnels. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing. Yeah. You go down really deep in some of the sections. And that was just the one chance you could do it freely with the staff there explaining all of the instruments that were still there. It's like a time capsule museum. It sounds like uh, Ottawa has its own catacombs. Which I I really you know I I really hope that this campus will not be impacted by the Ottawa Hospital. I probably shouldn't be saying that, but I think Heritage Ottawa also agrees this would be devastating. Um, it would be also I think great to mount a, a petition to have the telescope reinstalled at Science and Tech or Ingenium as it's now called. Yeah. yeah. I think that would be there is also a record of um, back in the 1970s uh, of uh, many of the astronomers going to Parliament and voicing it through uh, politicians to try and uh, reopen the observatory even back then. Interesting. And that was even after the telescope was first moved to the National Museum hmm. of Science. And uh, so, yes. We have a few more questions, a few more minutes. Um, question, I understand that modern digital astronomy techniques make light pollution less of an issue today. Conceivably, a, simply, a simple modern telescope could be installed in the dome and the facility reused for scientific training and promotion. Can you comment on that idea and its challenges? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's already being thought of um, again, uh, the 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 membership of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada were the ones who first asked Parliament back at Confederation for our first national observatory. So really, RASC has been there from the beginning, before this observatory even existed. They they were the ones who promoted William King and Otto Klotz, and uh, also Sir Sanford Fleming was part of it too because of all of the, the need to have a, a time that was synchronized for the whole country. This is where it started uh, to come together. So yeah, everything is intertwined. Very much so. Yeah. Very true. And here's a comment to thank you for highlighting the architectural rich, richness of the Dominion Observatory. It's practically on, on uh, this person's uh, it's practically their favorite federal building in Ottawa. They knocked on the door about 10 years ago and was given a tour, including the dome. And the comment closes with, let's save the building. And uh, a further comment, what is the word that you used for the small building in front of the observatory? So there's a Within couple eight. of small buildings. So the important one that links the prime meridian is called an azimuth. Azimuth? Yes, an azimuth. So there's supposed to be two to create a triangulation. Right. But when they widen Carling Avenue, which is behind yeah. the observatory, they knocked down the northern one. So we lost part of the triangle. Yeah. But the prime meridian is very, very important. And uh, astronomers and groups um, are trying to get it celebrated better. They would like to have um, a, a brass a line go across just like they have in Greenwich and they figure mm -hmm. it could just be just like that. The other thing that's important about the observatory is everybody's focused on the main building, but it's the buildings collectively that, that are like a working, they work together to create what is the astronomy, so the science. And it's amazing to have them all in functional order. They're missing their main tools, but if you put them back in there, they'd work just like 100 years ago. It's a working building. That's, that's a really important comment. And do you have any insight about how the application to have the site named a National Historic Site is going? Uh, no, but I do understand that um, uh, Heritage Ottawa is, has been a key advocate 
for trying to have it named as a National Historic Site. And uh, our the subcommittee that I belong to is the Dominion Observatory Preservation Committee. And we wrote an article, I believe, in 2021 for the Heritage Ottawa Newsletter. Mm -hmm. And it outlines some of the priorities that we're trying to figure out. We also are being noticed more by the community, the Carling community, and they're concerned about light pollution even for the neighborhood. And that, of course, also concerns us because we would like to still maintain um, viewing. Even though there's a lot of light pollution, too much now to do research, and that's why the main astronomy program closed down. Plus, there was progress in technology. To this day, it would be a great hub for educating everybody in astronomy because it's very sorely lacking in the capital. You have to go really far out to um, CARP or, or even further to get you know a hint of this information and it's only like once and whenever you know you you can and this place is so uh, key with all of the you know the the new transit and everything that it would be easier to get to and uh and preserve like the history basically it's not just the building and the and the staff that work there it's it's actually something that could be shared for generations later just as a you know keep Canada on the map for its scientific pursuits. And for our contributions. And it's, as you say, it's so very accessible. And a final question. Um, do you know who um, fabricated the telescope? Was it done in Canada or was it? Um, it was, it was actually sent. Um, I have the name, but it, it's the lens is the only kind in the world right now that uh, is of that size and of that thickness, even though the telescope that's even at the Astrophysical Observatory, because they, the technology changed so much by the time they built the observatory here in 1904, they already were trying to drum up support to build a second one <laughs> to feed back the information they really desperately needed from the astrophysical one they finally built in BC on that hilltop there. So they took one of the main staff from the Ottawa Observatory here and sort of planted him over there to mentor them, the astronomers, astronomers over there, to feed that information back to the national one. And the, it's called the Brashear lens. And it's, it's, uh, it's still in the Dominion Telescope to this day. And a lot of researchers, um, they basically refer back to it. It was it was created in the United States, and then it was shipped back here to order to Canada for our first largest telescope at that time. But only ten years later was another t telescope surpassed. But it never ever got that type of lens. So still to this day, it has that fame for that, and it's not been created since. Hmm. Historical and scientific. Um... Mm -hmm meaning and intent that we should definitely make sure it's preserved. And I'm sure it's in good hands at Ingenium, but as I say, it'd be wonderful to see that thing, you know, functioning again in some capacity, even if it's only for educational purposes. Yes. So, um, oh, someone's just commented that John Brashear was from Pennsylvania. So there, there you go, Pennsylvania. connection. So I think that's it for our questions. So I think we'll, we'll um, wrap up now. And uh, if anybody has any additional questions, please feel free to uh, email them to Heritage Ottawa at info at heritageottawa.org, and we can uh, forward them to, to Sharon for response. Sharon, thanks again for an absolutely fascinating uh, presentation. I still have tons of questions here, so I'll be um, emailing them to you. And it has something to do with the decoration inside and having that dome done by uh, Juan Guerre, which I think is just so prescient. I'd love to know more about who decided to have that done. Um, so thank you again on behalf of everyone who's here. And uh, I'd like to remind everyone that our next Heritage Ottawa lecture is going to take place on the 17th of April. And our presenter will be Jean-Luc Pilon, who will be talking about the identification of a long ignored indigenous cultural landscape in the national capital region and the road that led us here. 
So I hope that you can uh, join us for that lecture. And finally, I'd like to mention that these lectures are provided free of charge, and we encourage you to consider joining Heritage Ottawa if you haven't, if you're not already a member, and to donate to the organization to help continue our efforts to share heritage stories. All that information is uh, available on Heritage Ottawa website. And so I'll say again, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you all who were able to join us tonight, and I wish you all a good night.